Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Richard Mendelson, and I am faculty in the Graduate Psychology Department at Kaiser University based in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Not only am I an industrial and organizational psychologist by training, but I'm also a bit of a historian in our field. That is the reason I am here with you today. I'm going to be discussing concepts of our field that are key theoretical constructs known as behaviorism, gestalt psychology, and psychoanalytic theories. Behaviorism. If we had to define what behaviorism is, it is a theoretical construct that explains the manner in which human beings and animals perform actions as a result of different types of conditioning. Behaviorism puts forward the belief in the ideas that psychological disorders can be treated using techniques that are designed to alter behavior. So essentially, we can teach people not to behave in the way that they may initially feel that they should but instead to behave in prescribed manners that society may believe to be or may deem to be more socially appropriate responses to the stimuli that a person is exposed to. Behaviorism, it focuses on the external behavior as opposed to the internal thought processes that may lead someone to want to behave in what we would consider an inappropriate manner. So as a whole, behaviorism is really focused on what we can externally observe in terms of a person's behavior in response to a certain stimuli or multiple stimulus in the environment. There are two types of conditioning that are really widely discussed in terms of behaviorism. There's operant conditioning and there's classical conditioning. So operant conditioning focuses on rewards and punishments in order to reinforce desired behaviors. So for example, operant conditioning uh, it's applicable in situations that, well, let me give you an example. If, uh, if you happen to be a parent, if you're outside in front of your home and your child runs into a street, it's not uncommon that a parent may grab the child and prevent them from running into the street and give them some form of punishment, up to and including sometimes corporal punishment like a spanking or a, a little smack on, on the backside. The child doesn't necessarily understand that running into the street could be very dangerous, but the child will learn through repeated processes of this exchange that if they run into the street, they're likely to get a spanking. If the child runs into the street and gets a spanking every time they run into the street, ultimately the child will associate getting a spanking with running into the street, which will in turn result in the child not running into the street anymore in spite of the fact that the child does not necessarily understand what the true damage or true dangerous outcomes could be for their action, through operant conditioning, through the presentation of punishment for specific actions, the child will learn they don't want the punishment so they cannot perform that action again. When the child stops running into the street because they understand if they do they might get a spanking, that child has, has been successfully conditioned through operant conditioning not to run into the street anymore. Classical conditioning is quite different. Classical conditioning pairs two stimuli together in order to cause or elicit a prescribed response from a person or from an animal. So, for example, a very famous example of uh, classical conditioning is what we will discuss later in this presentation with a person named Ivan Pavlov and his dogs. But in a nutshell, Pavlov used classical conditioning to elicit a prescribed behavior from the dogs that he used as experimental subjects. Pavlov presented dogs with food and noticed that when food was present, dogs begin to produce more saliva in their mouths. What Pavlov did every time he presented food to the dogs, he also rang a bell. Over time, when the dogs heard the bell ring, even if no food was present, the dogs began to produce additional saliva. The dogs began to salivate from the sound of the bell, even when the food wasn't present. And in classical conditioning, that is called acquisition, which means the dogs have, a, have now acquired a behavior as a result of classical conditioning. 
Now, as you can probably imagine, if you continue to ring a bell and not present food, the dog will then realize the bell does not mean that food is present and the dog's brain will not cause the dog's mouth to produce additional saliva. What that does is it causes what's called extinction, meaning the dog will no longer produce additional saliva at the sound of the bell. So acquisition is when classical conditioning is learned, classical conditioning results in the desired response, and extinction is when that desired response no longer happens to the stimulus that you added to the process. A very well-known behaviorist was B.F. Skinner. He lived from 1904 to 1990. B.F. Skinner focused on operant conditioning. He introduced the concept of a reinforcer, which for the first time was uh, the addition of a positive, uh, a, a positive outcome or result for behaving in a specific way. For example, if we were to go back to when I was discussing a child running into the street a moment ago, instead of adding a spanking when the child ran into the street, what B.F. Skinner would do was every time the child did not run into the street, he would add some type of a reward. That reward would become the reinforcer. It reinforced the positive behavior. B.F. Skinner was one of the first people who really, who really learned and understood and also communicated through his experimental research and his writing that there are different types of reinforcers. For example, punishment can be the addition of a negative outcome as a response to specific actions. There are also positive reinforcers, which is, as I said, the addition of a positive outcome for doing what is expected or desired of you. But there's also what's called negative reinforcers, which means you take something away. So, for example, if a child runs into the street and you don't spank the child, if a child is not being given a punishment for it, a negative reinforcer would be saying to the child, you ran into the street, so today we're not going to have a sweet treat or ice cream or dessert at dinner, for example. This was pretty revolutionary at that time because up until that point, people who were studying this, studying behaviorism, uh, studying operant conditioning, really only recognized the fact that the children or the adults would perform actions at certain times based solely on whether or not there was punishment involved. So B.F. Skinner kind of revolutionized this field of study in that way. Uh, he also was able to demonstrate this with animals. Uh, what B.F. Skinner did, he taught rats that if they wanted to get food, they had to perform an action. So he created what is known as the Skinner box. The Skinner box was essentially a cage for a small animal like a rat and there wasn't a food dish in the box. But the rat would learn if they pushed a lever down, a pellet of food would be introduced into the box. So he taught the rats that they could press down on a bar and that would result in them getting food. So per for performing the desired action, which is pressing the bar, he positively reinforced that behavior by providing them with a reward, the food or the water that they seek at that time, which is why they learned to press the bar in the first place. Ivan Pavlov, I mentioned him a moment ago. He's very, very well known for his studies on dogs and salivation. Pavlov was incredibly focused on classical conditioning. Dogs were used as his, as his experimental animals. And he discovered what's called the condition reflex, meaning that a reflexive action, something that's not necessarily uh, done by a person's free will, but instead is done as a result of autonomic responses. For example, we can't sit and decide, I want to salivate more now and cause our mouth to produce more saliva. But Pavlov recognized that he could trick the brain into performing this action by pairing stimuli together. One stimuli would normally cause that reaction that's desired. The other one had nothing to do with the desired outcome. But by pairing the two stimuli together, for example, the bell 
and the presentation of dog food, Pavlov was able to demonstrate that over time, he could classically condition dogs to salivate merely at the sound of a bell. John Broadus Watson lived from 1878 to 1958. Watson was focused on classical conditioning as well. He studied the impact of learning on motion, meaning what types of experiences does a person have that they learn from that then influences the behaviors that they produce in the future. Watson studied children rather than animals. He attempted to condition children to be afraid of neutral stimuli. Now, John Watson was probably most famous for what is called the Little Albert Experiment. In this day and age, what Watson did would be considered incredibly unethical. Watson, unbeknownst to a parent, took a child who was in the daycare in the university or hospital that he worked in. He worked with the same child every day without the parent's permission. What he did, alongside one of his lab assistants, every day he presented a child with stimuli. For example, a white rat or a fluffy bunny. Watson would present this animal to the child who did not exhibit a fear response to the animal. But what Watson did over time, when he would present the animal, he would try and scare the child through the use of an incredibly loud, loud noise. Uh, perhaps the banging of uh, pots and pans, uh, something of that nature. So what Watson did over time, he conditioned the child, who we call Little Albert, which was not his real name, to exhibit a fear response every single time the child was presented with the fluffy animal, which under normal circumstances would not exhibit a fear response from that child. He conditioned children to develop phobias of specific things. So he demonstrated that classical conditioning can be used on people as well as on animals. Now, as I stated earlier, the Little Albert experiment would be considered highly unethical in this day and age. Uh, it is important to note though that the child who was involved in the study, although there are many rumors, uh, many articles written online, uh, the child ended up growing up to be okay. There wasn't any type of long-term or lasting damage done to that child. However, nowadays there are ethical principles in place that would absolutely prevent a researcher from doing a study of this nature, especially without the permission of a parent. Edward Thorndike lived from 1874 to 1949. Thorndike focused on operant conditioning, and he created what became known as puzzle boxes. Essentially, what was done was a box with a maze inside it was created, and an animal was placed inside that box. The animal would be presented with opportunities to walk through the maze and turn either left or right. Thorndike postulated that he could train an animal to walk successfully through that maze if he provided rewards at different turns. So for example, if Thorndike wanted the rat to turn right at one of the intersections, he would provide some type of a reward. For example, a pellet of food. If the animal turned left, there was no food that was present. So the animal followed the food and made the turns that Thorndike wanted until it successfully completed walking through the maze. Now the interesting thing is over time, Thorndike was able to remove the food stimulus and the animal could still successfully walk through the maze because it had learned that if it made certain turns and moved in certain directions, a reward would be present. So for example, when the rat came to the first intersection, it was accustomed to turning right and finding a food pellet. Once the food pellet was removed, the animal would turn right, and there wasn't a pellet, but the animal would keep moving forward in the path that it had learned would successfully get it to navigate through that maze to the end. Now, Thorndike also understood that once the response was learned, eventually extinction could occur, meaning over time if you refuse to provide the reward, 
the animal would stop making the prescribed turns and would learn or unlearn to successfully navigate through that maze. Behaviorism today. In treatment of different disorders, uh, such as ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, um, anxiety, and I apologize, ADHD is uh, attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. Uh, in treatment of these types of disorders, cognitive behavioral therapy can be used, which essentially means that someone can work with a child and teach that child what appropriate responses are and what appropriate actions are to take when that child feels a certain way or experiences an, a response to specific stimuli in his or her environment. Uh, behavior modification techniques are used to try to eliminate undesirable behaviors. These are things that are heavily employed in schools. Uh, many child psychologists use these and even psychotherapists that work with adult clientele and patients. They use behaviorism and cognitive behavioral therapy today to try and help people navigate uh, how to respond to different stimuli in what we consider to be socially acceptable ways. We're moving on to what is known as Gestaltism. Gestaltism is recognition of an organized whole as opposed to recognition of the componential parts of an object. For example, if you look to the side that way, whoops, that way, you will see a picture. That picture, when you look at it from a holistic perspective, is clearly a black and white dog's face. But if you take a closer look, you will see that that is actually what is called a mosaic of many individual pictures. And each of these individual pictures is also a picture of a dog. What we see from Gestaltism is that it is easy for a person to look at the totality and see the big dog's face in their initial appraisal of what that picture is. Upon closer examination, we see that there are many individual parts that are used to complete that picture as a whole. Gestaltism focuses on the whole. It is the perception of oneness from many, which is the actual literal definition or translation of what the word Gestaltism means. Gestaltism is a German word, and the reason why is many of the Gestalt psychologists were rooted in German or Austrian ancestry uh, and lived in those areas at the time when Gestaltism was really pioneered. Max Wertheimer lived from 1880 to 1943. Wertheimer is credited as a founder of the Gestalt psychology movement and he conceived something called the Phi Phenomenon. Now the Phi Phenomenon uh, it takes multiple pictures of an object, still pictures, but when, when these pictures are shown in very rapid succession, one after the other very quickly, it provides the illusion of movement. It tricks people's brains into perceiving movement in the images that we see, even though no movement really exists. That's what the Phi Phenomenon is. Now, if, it's, if uh, the pictures are presented and they're not at a rapid speed, it's easier for us to see them as separate pictures. If we present the pictures very quickly, we tend to perceive it in our brain as if movement is occurring, even if it isn't. This is also known as what's called apparent motion. This is what the five phenomenon looks like. Now what you'll see here is a series of still pictures. Now, each of these pictures has left a different spot blank. When shown in rapid succession, it appears that movement is occurring. The reality is, what you're seeing is a series of still pictures. No movement is actually happening. But our brain perceives this as if movement is occurring because of how quickly the pictures are shown in succession to one another. Fritz Perls. Perls lived from 1893 to 1970. He's credited with coining the term Gestalt Psychology. He was the first person to give this 
uh, this recognition of oneness, uh, a name. He was the first one to call it Gestaltism. Perils was known as a deeply flawed individual. Uh, he was not well liked by many, uh, although in all fairness to him, uh, as he aged and got older, people did tend to perceive him as being nicer than he was when he was younger. Perils was known as a misogynist. He was not kind to women. Uh, he was known as an anti-Semite and even a racist. Uh, at that period of time in Germany, this was not an uncommon thing, especially for people who were upwardly mobile in different political groups. Uh, some, of the, some of the positive things that Perils contributed to psychology was the coining of the term Gestalt psychology, and he actually is credited with writing the first definitive text on Gestalt psychology. Psychoanalytic theory. Uh, it's a theoretical construct in which the goal is to treat mental disorders by exploring the way that our conscious and unconscious uh, experiences conflict as a result of our repressed memories and desires. Uh, what that means is we have experiences within us that we've processed in such a way that they're likely to elicit responses that society might deem as inappropriate. Uh, for example, uh, Freud was one of the founding fathers of psychoanalytic theory and he constructed his three-dimensional model of what he believed consciousness was, uh, which, which, which consisted of the id, the ego, and the superego, which I'm going to get to in just a moment. Uh, the technique of psychoanalysis encouraged patients to use techniques like free association. What that means is Freud would present a single word, and it didn't have to have anything to do with any specific topic or any issue that a patient was dealing with. But Freud encouraged that patient to respond to that word and continue to speak. Freud believed that if you just continue speaking, you will reach a point where your conscious mind gives way and the forces deeper within us would kind of permeate upwards to the surface and find ways, find cracks in what he believed were the facade that we show to other people and try and get out. Um, free association was a technique that was used uh, to form what he considered to be pathways for repressed ideas to reach the surface level of our being so that we could then try and unpack the issues that we had and determine what the root causes of those issues were. Sigmund Freud lived from 1856 to 1939. Now, in this corner of the screen here, on the top, you can see a visual representation of what Freud believed consciousness looked like. Now, at the top, you will see this is the iceberg above the surface of the water. This is the place where the facade, the, the mask that we wear for society to see, lives. Uh, it's what's visible, what's observable to other people. Now, the, the water level here is what Freud believed separated conscious thought from what he called pre-conscious thought. Now, pre-conscious thought is where the ego lives. There we go. Now, the ego is the uh, knowledge and experiences that people have that lead to our actions and our responses to stimuli. Now Freud believed that beneath the ego lived two, I guess we can call them darker realms of the human psyche. The superego, which is right here, operates based on perception and uh, the way that we perceive experiences. Uh, it's essentially where our interpretation of prior experiences takes place and we use that to formulate what we believe are the responses that people in society would accept and expect from us. But the deepest and darkest recesses of the psyche, in Freud's opinion, live right here, the id. Uh, 
Now the id, Freud believed, was what he called the teeming cesspool of repressed desires. This is where aggression lived. This is where sexual desire lived. Uh, whatever abnormal or deviant proclivities a person might have in any aspect of their existence, all were rooted deeply in the id. Now, what Freud believed is that much like an iceberg, which is imperfect, an iceberg is not a perfect, solid chunk of ice. There are cracks and fissures all throughout an iceberg. And what Freud believed is that if we were able to give a path upward, aspects of our id, our superego, and our ego could creep upward slowly and break the surface of consciousness and people would be able to get glimpses into who we are at the level of our ego, superego, and our id. So, Freud is credited as the founder of the psychoanalytic school of psychology. He pioneered a lot of different techniques, but some of the most notable things Freud is known for is his attempts at what he called dream interpretation and psychoanalysis. Freudian dream interpretation is very interesting because, well, part of the genius of Sigmund Freud, part of the reason why he's so well known even today, why he's essentially the face of modern psychology, is that <clears throat> his theories, they couldn't be tested. We don't have an empirical way to test through research whether the ego, the superego, or the id even exist. So we cannot prove that Freud was correct, but notably, we also cannot disprove his theories. Well, his beliefs about dream interpretation were very much the same. Back then, and even still today, we don't really have the ability to sit down and interpret with any degree of accuracy what dreams mean, or why we even have them. But what Freud believed was that your dreams were your brain's way of working through challenges that are experienced in your everyday life experiences. Uh, it was your brain's way of unpacking things that happened to you in the past. It was your brain's way of working through conflict that existed between your conscious mind and your mind beneath the level of consciousness, meaning everything beneath the water level here on the iceberg. Now what's interesting is that much like an iceberg, what's visible above the waterline right here is often a very small percentage of the totality of that iceberg. We can't even see a quarter of this or, or a third of the iceberg above the waterline. So Freud really recognized and postulated that the bulk of, of, of who we really are at the deepest levels of, of our, our brain's way of processing and thinking and interpreting experiences was not something that was readily observable to the general public or to the people beyond you as an individual. So Freud contributed enormously to the field of psychoanalytics. Another interesting topic that Freud brought up is what's known as parapraxis. Now, parapraxis is also known as the Freudian slip. Uh, this occurs when a person is speaking and mistakenly says one word instead of the word they really mean to say. So you can see in the picture that's down below that way, Sigmund Freud, and he says, what's a Freudian slip, you ask? It's when you say one word and mean your mother. Uh, another. <laughs> so essentially, what Freud would say is we tend to have opportunities for our id, ego, and superego to break through the surface of the water and make themselves visible when we're speaking. Uh, there are many reasons why this picture is funny, but uh, one of the things that Freud was very, very well known for uh, is essentially telling his psychoanalysis patients that a lot of the damage that they had experienced that was causing them to have conflict and disorders today was deeply rooted in their childhood. 
and the problems and experiences they had during childhood were the reason that they were having so many challenges in their everyday life now. Uh, Freud had a, an interesting childhood, uh, and Freud believed that much of the damage that people uh, allow to manifest as adults is a result of things that happened between the child and the parents. And in that day and age, the parent who was the primary caregiver for a young child, more often than not, was the mother. So Freud is very well known for saying, if it's not one thing, it's your mother. So that's why there are jokes about the way Freud would speak. Uh, Freud was a very interesting person who had an enormous impact on the field of psychology as a whole, as well as on psychoanalytic processes. This is a list of other major psychoanalytic contributors. Now, these are all people who have built on the work that was performed by Sigmund Freud. Uh, notably among them, you see his daughter, Anna Freud, whose name is right here. And in addition to that, you have someone who served as Freud's protege or prized pupil. And that person's name is Carl Jung. Now, I'm going, to tell, uh, I'm going to tell you a story about Jung and Freud. Um, Jung was a very, very interesting person. He was learning about psychoanalysis from Sigmund Freud directly. Uh, they would have deep discussions about life experiences. They would talk about uh, the way that their subconscious mind uh, influenced their conscious mind in terms of behavior. And they would discuss their dreams in great depth. Now, the story I'm about to tell you resulted in a falling out between Freud and Carl Jung uh, that's pretty well documented in the lore or the annals of psychology. One day, Carl Jung showed up at Sigmund Freud's office and he said to him, I have to share a dream that I had with you last night. It was, it was deeply troubling. And Freud said, okay. So they sat down, and uh, Jung was laying down on a couch in Freud's office, which is where the cliche of a psychotherapist having a patient lay down on a couch has come from. Freud typically had his patients lay down and put them in a position where they could not see him. So he was more of a, a disembodied voice through their own path through this psychoanalytic process. But at any rate, I digress. Carl Jung laid down and began to relate the, uh, the contents of his dream to Sigmund Freud. So he says to him, Last night I fell asleep, and the dream I had was, was deeply, deeply disturbing. I saw myself, and I was in a coffin. I was dead, and there were people surrounding me, and the people were not mourning. The people were not sad at my demise. And I remember thinking and feeling during the dream that my life had been so sad because people didn't seem to be affected emotionally at any level that I could, that I could detect in spite of the fact that I had died. And Sigmund Freud became very, very unhappy with this. And he explained to Jung that Jung wanted to be just like Sigmund Freud. Jung saw himself as a younger version of Sigmund Freud. And Freud's interpretation of Jung's dream was that if Jung saw himself in a coffin, he essentially saw Sigmund Freud dead in a coffin. Jung's brain interpreted that as seeing himself dead. So Freud became very, very deeply insulted and said, you saw me dead in a coffin you believe that I'm no longer you know, viable, I'm not contributing anymore, uh, that you can't learn from me, and the fact that other people there were not unhappy means that my death means nothing to you, and that my passing would be something that while you may not rejoice from, you wouldn't feel any sense of remorse or sadness about either. So at that point, Freud ended the teacher and protege relationship with Carl Jung and essentially threw him out of his office, directed him not to come back. And it's said that until the day that they died, they did not speak again. 
Um, Carl Jung, however, did go on to do some incredibly seminal work in the field of psychology. Uh, in particular, some of the work that he did uh, has influenced every, most likely every book you've ever read, every movie you have ever seen, uh, every story that you've ever heard or that you have told. Uh, Jung developed what are known as Jungian archetypes. He recognized that every story and every movie, everything that, that uh, describes events historically, from the time that writing began and a written record of humanity began, it really had parallels to one another. So, for example, uh, every story that's passed down, whether it's a religious text, whether it's mythology, whatever the case may be, there are what he called universal archetypes, um, universal concepts. So, for example, characters in a story, there will always be a hero or a protagonist. There is always what he referred to as a damsel in distress or, you know, someone who needs help. Uh, there's always what he called the wise old man, meaning the teacher, the person who the hero goes to for advice, that, that sage or, or wise person that, that helps guide the hero. There's always the villain. There's always a, a best friend or a supporting role. Uh, that somebody in a story plays to help the hero along their path. Archetypes went beyond just the characters, though, and it went into the very core or root of the story as well. See, there are different types of journeys that stories go on. A hero may be going on some type of a quest. A hero may be going to perform a certain task. A hero may be going to cause or prevent a specific event. And Jung accounted for these in his theory of archetypes as well. But most important, what Jung realized was that there were universal archetypes in terms of what the stories represented. And he recognized that stories were always about things like death and rebirth, good versus bad, good versus evil, light versus darkness, life versus death. And these are constants in just about every single story, every single uh, book that's read, every single religious tome that people you know, read and learn and worship from. Jungian archetypes are things that Jung recognized had been present since human history began being recorded. What is also really interesting about